Hello, good evening, class of 2028. We are so thrilled that you're joining us here this evening to learn a little bit more about Penn State and the next steps in the enrollment process as admitted students. So uh, I hope you enjoyed the first part of this programming, connecting with your academic college and learning more about what your, your individual academic experience will look like, whether it was with engineering or earth and mineral sciences or education, getting some more details about what life in the classroom looks like. Um, again, my name is Kim Amy. I'm from the undergraduate admissions team here at Penn State, and we are thrilled that we're able to welcome you as admitted students. I know some of you maybe submitted your applications months ago. We are finally at the point where we're making a lot of decisions, and kudos to you um, on being accepted as part of the class of 2028. Uh, before we get started here, just a few housekeeping items. We're going in this session to talk about some of those, those key decision items that you're thinking about outside of academics as you're thinking about enrollment. So getting more information on student aid and housing, as well as new student orientation. Uh, we have a number of counselors here in the background that are happy to answer your questions. So you can use that Q&A feature at the bottom of the screen to ask questions throughout the presentation. And we will actually have a panel at the end of this presentation as well with counselors and students to answer any other questions that you might have both live and we'll continue doing the Q&A chat in the background here. We are also going to be sending out a recording of this. So anyone who's attended will get this after the fact via recording. So if you wanna uh, look back and see what we covered and see what questions uh, we answered, you'll have that um, in your inbox in a few days here. So with that, I just want to congratulate you again and welcome you to the Penn State family. So after that welcome, I do just want to spend a few more minutes celebrating you and talking about what you were bringing to Penn State as a part of the class of 2028. I mean, you heard a lot about what our academics are going to offer you, but you really have done so much to get here and to get to this point. You really should celebrate the fact that you are, are sitting there now with an offer of admission to Penn State University Park. Uh, it has been a competitive year for admission again. Um, we had actually right now we're over 96,000 applications to the university. So the fact that you have been admitted um, and early in the process means you're exceptional students with high promise. And we saw that you would make great additions to the community. And, and we wanted to get in, in front of you as quickly as possible to show you what those opportunities are. Uh, so first and foremost, something more about you is not only are you driven and passionate, you're also a diverse group of students. We've had applicants from all 50 states and over 140 countries. So while we are the state institution of Pennsylvania, and we're really proud to be um, in Pennsylvania and the flagship of that state, we see students from across the country and the globe. Um, and that diverse community here really helps you learn not just in the classroom, but outside of the classroom, because you're going to have students from all walks of life in class with you with different perspectives, different backgrounds. Um, and that really adds to the learning that takes place in the classroom because of those different perspectives that everyone is bringing, the different backgrounds that they, they have. And I did say that you're driven, and we know that obviously you're high academic achievers, but that's not all. Um, we're looking for students who are really going to add to the community and bring their passions here because they know that Penn State can support those passions and help them not only build on those, but also find new ones and new ways that they can contribute to the community at large. At large. Um, whether they're getting involved in clubs or organizations that you were involved in in high school or finding uh, finding new ways to contribute. We've read your essays, we've looked at what you're involved in, and we know that you can add true value to that Penn State community. Um, and you'll uh, encounter a number of other students with those same passions, as well as students with completely different interests that you can learn from and also grow alongside. 
Um, but what kind of uh, resources do we offer students here to, um, to make sure that they make the most out of their time as a Penn Stater? You'll see on this next slide that there are so many different organizations and resources behind you to make sure that as a part of the community, you're successful and you go on to represent Penn State well after graduation. So one of the best ways that we have students um, get involved at the university is through getting involved in clubs and organizations. Uh, almost 100% of Penn Staters are involved in at least one club or organization. And that's how we ended up with a thousand different ones here, right? Because you have passions, you're, yet you have our passions and clubs that you were involved in in high school. And likely, I can almost guarantee that those clubs and organizations exist here at the university. But if not, that's how you get to a thousand because students find different interests, find other students with those interests, become a recognized club, um, and then add to their legacy at Penn State by creating an organization that, that goes on beyond their time here. So whether you're involved in service organizations and want to continue that at Penn State, want to get involved in Greek life while you're here, if you're in athletics and want to do intramural sports or club sports, if you're in music and theater and want to keep performing, you don't need to be a, a major in our College of Arts and Architecture to take advantage of different organizations that allow you to still pursue that passion. So many different organizations to really help fill your time outside of the classroom. You heard a lot about the academic experience already today, but sometimes it's what you do outside of the classroom that's just as impactful during your time at college. So we encourage students to get involved in that way, get out and meet people um, and, and really spend their time outside of the classroom doing something meaningful and adding to that Penn State community. You heard a lot probably about our research opportunities from your academic college. And I just wanna say on a whole, that's where Penn State really does shine. Wherever you call home in terms of academics, know that you will have research opportunities at the university. This past year, we had actually a record setting 1.2 billion in uh, undergraduate research funding. So that means that our, our undergrads are involved in uh, research across all disciplines at the university at all levels. Um, so really it's not just those who are in a lab, you know, in the traditional, you know, with, with test tubes and lab coats and doing research, like you would think in the traditional STEM fields, whatever major you have, you're going to find faculty members doing research. They're, they're, leaders in their field. They're solving some of the world's biggest problems. And we can't do that at Penn State without outstanding students to be there next to them to help them accomplish their research goals. That's one great way you can add to your resume. Clubs and organizations is one way. Getting involved in research is another. And all of those things add up to preparing you for what you're going to do after you leave Penn State. And we do a lot here to also make sure you're well prepared for that time in your life. We have an outstanding career services office here. We're consistently ranked in the top 10. And that is a great resource for our students, but I think our students also shine and have such a great reputation. And you'll see that here um, because corporate recruiters actually rank us number five in terms of having the best trained graduates. So we have the great career services to prepare you for when those corporate recruiters come on campus. But those corporate recruiters are coming to campus year after year after year because they know Penn Staters are ready for the workforce. Uh, when they research and when they did this poll and they researched the corporate recruiters, they said that Penn Staters are hardworking, uh, great pro problem solvers, great creative thinkers, um, and they really want to have them working for them because they are such hard workers and they really contribute at a high level um, after they leave Penn State. So that great reputation is what's keeping them coming back year after year after year, but it's really our students who, who shine at those corporate events and really make a difference after they leave the university because of those resources that they had to prepare, you, prepare them for that time um, in their collegiate career. And then the last piece we want to touch on is the fact that there are hundreds of student-centered resources here to help make you as successful as possible. We are a large university here at University Park. We have 42,000 undergraduate students. I think one of the perks about being large is that there are so many different resources and offices and, and, and organizations that you can take advantage of to help make sure that you get the most out of your time here. And we want you to develop as a whole person, not just focus on your academics. You wanna make sure that you're developing culturally, spiritually, that you have your health and wellness in mind. And we have so many ways to support our students to make sure that they can really be as successful as possible and maximize their time here by taking advantage of those resources, whether it's getting help in their classes through our Penn State Learning um, or getting guidance on what classes to take from their academic advisors. Or if you're looking for, you know, more of a wellness track, you have obviously our campus recreation and all our workout facilities here and the classes they provide, our intramural sports program. 
but also wellness and, and mental health are really important to students. And we want to make sure that that you're in your, your best best place when you're going to class and really taking advantage of, of what's there. So if you need to use them, whether it's for something as simple as taking um, advantage of stress relieving um, activities during finals week, like which we just had this week, something as simple as that. Or if you need maybe more individual or group therapy options, we have our counseling and psychological services here to support you. We also want you to develop culturally, whether it's taking advantage of the great programming through our Student Programming Association. They have concerts, they have speakers that come to campus routinely. Uh, we have our Eisenhower um, Auditorium that brings in a number of touring acts um, each semester. We have concerts in our Bryce Jordan uh, Center um, of all shapes and sizes. Um, and then we have a lot of other ways that students just choose to fill their time outside of the classroom and then also leave campus and explore things more globally by taking advantage of our education abroad options through Penn State Global. Really no shortage of ways that you can make sure that whatever you want your Penn State story to be, that you can craft that because you have the offices there to support you um, and all of these people who have kind of uh, blaze, blaze the path for you and found ways to contribute to the Penn State community. And we know you have so many different talents and interests that you're going to just further add to that outstanding reputation that we have as an institution. But we know there are some things that you still are considering as you're determining where you want to enroll in the future. Uh, so on this next slide, you'll see that we're going to cover a few more things for you about what's next in the process. We know that you still have a few months before you have to decide ultimately where you want to attend, but we want to make sure you have all the information that you need to make the best decision for you. Uh, so I'm going to we're going to start off with student aid. I'm going to hand it over to my colleague Krista to answer some of those questions for you about student aid. Thank you, Kim. Hi, everybody. Um, I'm one of the student aid coordinators in the Office of Student Aid at University Park. So the main role of my office is to help students and families understand the financial aspects um, of paying for college and what options are available to explore. So to be considered for financial aid, uh, for federal aid, um, through our office, each student must complete the free application for federal student aid, also known as the FAFSA. Um, Penn State does not use the CSS profile, we just use the FAFSA. Um, this year, the FAFSA is not ready October 1st as it typically is. Um, it has gone through quite a refresh through the Department of Education. Um, they simplified it, it has a lot fewer questions, um, navigation is a lot easier. Um, some pretty cool features are coming out of that. Um, so it's not available yet. We expect it to be ready um, December 31st. Um, so as soon as it's available, um, please get on the studentaid.gov website and fill it out so that we can start the aid review process. Um, we'll start sending the aid notifications out in uh, your mind Penn State portal uh, beginning in like, mid to late March. Um, so just keep an eye out for that. Um, and that's for if you're applying for fall of 2024, you would need the 24-25 FAFSA. Um, if anyone's going to start in the summer, um, you can complete the 23-20 or FAFSA, um, and that's available now on studentaid.gov, so you can you can do that. Um, and uh, once you do that, we'll review aid eligibility. We'll send those notifications out um, in April sometime. Um, so you also can, um, in the meantime, you can start exploring uh, scholarships. Um, you can find them through uh, your community, um, some of the searches online, um, your you can start looking at your academic colleges for any merit-based scholarships that they might have there. Um, and you can do that all year round. Um, actually, we recommend that you search for scholarships all year round throughout your entire uh, college career. Um, follow us on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram. We post scholarships all year round um, from different organizations that we get. They're not always tied to a major. Um, we also post updates um, about student aid throughout the year, um, different things that you might need to know. Um, and I also want to, uh, so I want to mention, I said we do use the FAFSA. So um, international students are not eligible to complete the FAFSA, um, but you may be eligible for other types of aid, such as a private education loan or a merit-based scholarship through your academic college. So you'll want to check with them, um, but you'll find more information on any kind of uh, financing options available um, through the Penn State Global, which is global.psu.edu is their website. So you can go there and, and find more information. Um, I'm happy to answer any of your questions on a panel later in the session. I'll also be in the, the Q&A chat answering questions along the way. 
Um, and with that, I will hand it off to Kate to talk about housing and food services. Thanks so much, Krista, and good evening, everyone. My name is Kate, and I am here representing housing and food services today. So um, obviously part of um, coming to Penn State is also living on campus. So here at University Park, we require first year students to live on campus. That is a requirement. So all first year students are guaranteed on campus housing at University Park. And we have over 14,000 students who are living with us on campus. So it's a really robust community and we've got a lot of options for you. Um, what's important to remember here is um, that when you accept your offer of admission to attend Penn State, at the same time, you're also accepting your housing contract to live on campus. And once you have that contract, you're able to log into our system, which is called eLiving. And there is where you're able to indicate your housing preferences on your contract. So those preferences are due by noon on May 15th. And some preferences that you could indicate, you could list if you have a roommate request. It's certainly not required. And I would say about 50% of first year students do not have a roommate request. And that's okay. You can also indicate if you are interested in a particular housing area or room type. So we give you the opportunity to list your first choice and second choice in a housing area and room type. And we've got a lot of information on our website. Our website is liveon.psu.edu. And there's a lot of really good information there that tells you about these five housing areas and the different um, buildings and room types that we have. Another preference that you're able to indicate there is your meal plan preference. There are three levels for your meal plan and it's a declining balance, super easy to use. Most students will start out at a level two and those can be uh, increased or de decreased throughout the semester and um, really flexible for students. And then finally, the, the last um, preference that they can indicate are living learning communities that we have. And there are over 20 living learning communities that we have across campus. And these range from academic-based to interest-based. And essentially, a living learning community means that you're living together with some of your peers with similar interests. You've got a little bit of um, some, some involvement from residence life and some faculty and staff who may be involved in some programming. There are opportunities for networking and events that you can participate in. So it's a really great way to live together um, in a particular building with some of your peers and who share similar interests. And then um, housing assignments. So room assignments are processed um, in random order. So it is not dependent on when you accept your offer of admission. So that means every student has equal chance at getting their preferred room uh, type and roommate. And we will say these are not guaranteed, but um, the housing assignment office does their best to try to get students um, in the housing area and room type um, that, that they're interested in. So assignments will um, post, if you're going to be attending Penn State University Park for the summer, those room assignments will go live in late June. And if you are arriving for fall semester, those assignments will go live in late July. So plenty of time um, to meet your roommates, plan on, on what you're packing and get yourself situated so that you're ready to move in um, either for, for late June for summer session or for late August uh, for the fall semester. So um, with that, I am happy to answer questions when we get to the panel and I'm gonna kick things over to Kim to talk about new student orientation. Thanks, Kate. Uh, yeah, the last piece we want to cover today, it might seem like it's very far away, but it will be here before you know it, and that's new student orientation. Uh, so we want to just kind of highlight what to expect from new student orientation at Penn State should you then accept your offer, pay your deposit, and start on that enrollment uh, process. 
So first you should know it is required for all incoming enrolling students at Penn State University Park. So it is a two day program that is held here on campus. Students arrive just after lunch on the first day. Uh, they will plan to be in a residence hall with another incoming student. Um, and then they will have a, almost a full day of activities on the second day where you're going to do a lot of things during that time frame. One of the biggest things though, and what people are most excited to do is actually sit down with advisors and plan their, ac their academic plan and their schedule for that upcoming semester. So if you're a summer student, you'll do both summer and fall semester planning at orientation, or if you're coming for the fall, you will just do your fall uh, session there. So it is an overnight program, like I said, with all um, different cohorts coming to campus throughout the summer. You'll see a little bit more in the next slide about what to anticipate throughout new student orientation. There are a lot of steps to becoming a Penn Stater, but the nice thing is, is our orientation office has it all outlined for you in the NSO task list. So it is gonna tell you all the things that you have to do to get ready to come for orientation, what you'll be doing while you're at orientation, and then all those things you still have to take care of after orientation. So some of these things are just you know, registering for your orientation, but it's also taking care of your immunizations. It's taking care of sending us any information about maybe some AP courses or dual enrollment courses that you've had and you wanna get credit for. Uh, a lot of things on that checklist, it is kind of gonna walk you through everything as you go through the enrollment process so you don't miss anything along the way um, and make sure that you're set up best for success once you arrive to start taking classes at Penn State. So the process won't uh, kick off for a little bit here. So if you've already accepted your offer, that's great, uh, but you probably won't necessarily hear from orientation for a few months yet. They start communicating with students in March um, about some of the things that they can do to prepare for the actual launch of the reservations, which starts in April. So in April, we will, they will post the available sessions for students who once they've paid that enrollment deposit, they can register to attend those new student orientation um, offerings in May, June, or July. I will also point out that they're not, um, you know, just open for anyone to come to any specific date. Um, they are kind of based on the different colleges that are having uh, their, um, their sessions those days. So you might want to come with your best friend, but you're maybe in a different term um, or a different academic college, and they might not have the same orientation dates as you. And that's, that is how it's structured. So um, you'll have, see the dates that are available for you based on which semester you're starting and which academic program you're in. Um, and you can register for those that are offered throughout the summer. And then the last piece we wanna highlight as part of that orientation process is that students aren't going through it alone. Uh, there is a concurrent parents and families program uh, for any supporters of students who are coming to campus. So while students are, are off doing some of their things, parents and family members are also getting some orientation to what it's like to be a parent or um, a guardian of a student who's coming to Penn State. It is absolutely optional for, for that population. Uh, we encourage uh, parents and family members to come, um, but uh, the student is the only one that is required to do it and, and stay on campus. Parents and family members can stay anywhere in the wonderful town of State College and participate in uh, this parents and families program. You'll have great sessions on how to stay connected with your student when they're in Penn State, how to support them through this transition so they can be successful. Um, and you'll see when you are making a reservation for orientation, you can also bring up to two guests with you to attend that program. Um, you'll see the website there, orientation.psu.edu, has a lot of great information about all the steps um, in the orientation process. And that once students complete that, it, they'll finish up their task list and step on campus for the start of their semester. So I know we covered a lot this evening and we're ready to answer even more of your questions. So uh, we want to say congratulations again on your offer of admission to Penn State and being a member of the class of 2028. I'm gonna actually hand uh, things over to my colleague Beth here to moderate our Q&A session. Um, again, congratulations and we look forward to chatting more. Wonderful, thanks Kim and all the other panelists that we had uh, speaking previously. My name is Beth, I am part of the undergraduate admissions team at Penn State University Park and I am gonna add my name to the list of those that wanna wish you a huge congratulations for being in those seats out there. You've worked extremely hard to get this admissions offer to University Park and we couldn't be more proud of you. Um, we want to continue the fun and turn things over to our panel to answer the questions that you all have. You've been submitting a lot behind the scenes. Please 
continue to do so. We have a lot of counselors, as Kim mentioned earlier on, behind the scenes answering those questions, but we'll also pull some of those to answer live. Uh, to do that, we're going to get some help from some of our current students. So I'm going to have them join us on camera and on mic here as they introduce themselves. We do have I Ava, Maddie, and Nathaniel joining us this evening. So um, Maddie, are you on? We can start with you. Yes. So hi, everyone. My name is Maddie. I am a third year student at Penn State University Park, majoring in broadcast journalism with a minor in entrepreneurship and innovation. Wonderful. Thanks, Maddie, for being here. Ava, are you on? Yes. Hi, everyone. My name is Ava. I'm currently a second year studying forensic science on the biology track. Wonderful. And our final student joining us is Nathaniel. Hello, everyone. Uh, as previously stated, my name is Nathaniel. I am a third year secondary education English major with a focus and a minor in uh, the English language. We are so excited the three of you are here because we have found time and time again that our audience wants to speak with you and hear your viewpoints and your answers. So we're going to start our questions off with all three of you answering the same question. Can you tell me a little bit about one of the clubs or activities that you're involved in here at Penn State? So we'll go in that same order. So Maddie, we'll start with you. Yeah, absolutely. So one of the things that I'm involved in is actually writing for Penn State's newspaper, The Daily Collegian. Um, it's one of the oldest and most well-respected student newspapers in the country. Um, so I've been doing that for a while. I'm on their lifestyle staff. So I get to write super fun articles about things that are trendy, not just on campus, but also, you know, in general, that sort of thing. So that's something that I've been really enjoying. Uh, one of the things that I'm currently involved in is the Penn State Sign Language Organization. So basically, we have meetings every Tuesday, learn new signs, and that's very fun to like get to learn the language. We have actual sign language professors come in and help teach us the signs. And sometimes we have signing events in the hub. We have like silent coffees where we all sign to each other. You know, it's just very fun. Um, I'm a member of the Penn State Filipino Association. So... Um... My background and one of my cultures that I come from is um, from the Philippines, and it's a great way of, you know, involving myself in the culture, learning more about the culture, and in essence, being surrounded by fellow Filipinos and the Pennsylvania State University community. All three really great choices, and those are just three of the over 900 clubs and organizations that we have at University Park, so you can only imagine all of the opportunities that are available to you students uh, once you step foot on our campus and get involved. Um, we love all the questions that are being submitted, and I have seen an awful lot about scholarship opportunities. So I'm going to bring our panelist, Krista, back up on screen to just kind of go over a little bit more information about scholarship opportunities. Sure. So scholarships at Penn State. Um, so Office of Student Aid, we do all our awarding through the FAFSA. So it's all need based. Um, we do have some scholarships, um, you know. The money does run out, <laughs> um, so it is limited through our office. But like I said, it's just based on the FAFSA and need based. Um, students are going to want to go to their academic college um, because that's where the other scholarships come from. That would be um, some are merit based, some are merit and need based. It just depends on the academic college and the actual individual scholarship itself. Because um, whoever funds that particular award gets to dictate, um, you know, all the eligibility criteria. Um, and it's important that students go out to their website and check it out because um, some of the colleges require a separate application and they do have deadlines. Um, so you want to make sure. And then also, you know, they might have, you know, they might need an application for first year students, but not second year or vice versa. So it's really important to go out to look at each of those just to make sure they're not missing any opportunities for that free money. Um, we can, so on our website, which is a studentaid.psu.edu, you, um, there's a types of aid section on there with a scholarship section. And there's information on there about scholarships that are available through Penn State. So there's um, scholarships through our office that would require a separate application um, aside from just the FAFSA. Um, so you can go check out what those are, uh, but also other administrative units and um, 
there's an outside scholarship section on there that has tips on where to find scholarships in your community, um, you know, through your high school, through organizations in your, you know, in, in your local community, how to do web searches. There's also, that's where you'll find the links to our social media pages. So just follow us on one of them. And as I mentioned earlier, we do post scholarships all year round. Um, we get from outside organizations. We have a team that goes over them, make sure that, you know, they're legitimate and good for our students. Um, and you can go ahead and see um, what's out there. And some are tied to a major, some are not. Um, and there's a variety. Sometimes it's an application. Sometimes it's a video. Uh, sometimes it's just a survey. It just depends, you know, whatever that organization is looking for to do with that particular award. Um, but they're out there. You just have to do a little, uh, little research and, and find them out there. Um, but they're there. And you should be looking all year round um, until you graduate. Great. Thanks so much, Krista. And Kim, I'm going to bring you back on um, as part of that question as well, because I know that uh, you have some information about a couple questions that we've seen in the chat as well. So if you have any information to share about uh, additional scholarship opportunities, we'd love to hear about those. Sure. So um, there were a couple questions in there about the provost award, which is an award that is, is managed through the undergraduate admissions office. So just a few things about that. There is no application for that award. Every student who receives an offer of admission to the university per campus is reviewed for that automatically. Uh, so it does not come with your, you've, if you've gotten decisions, you'll know that there is no financial aid information in that decision uh, packet yet. Uh, we don't start making decisions about provost awards until a little bit later, late January, early February is typically when we start notifying students. Uh, so I will also point out, though, that it, it, it is competitive. Um, so we're looking at somewhere around 10% of our incoming students get provost awards. So keep that in mind. Um, but if you do get awarded, you'll get information via email. And it'll also be on your student aid package when you do get that um, in March. Great. Thanks, Kim. And while we have you on camera, I'm going to throw another question your way. Yeah. We have some questions also uh, concerning AP credits. So how can students that are coming in as first year students bring those AP credits with them? Yes, great question. Um, and you are there are a lot of different AP courses and actually you can go to the admissions website and under the academics portion, there's a section called academic credit. So you can look under AP and see the different uh, classes that are there. When you look at each one, it'll tell you exactly what um, what score you had to get on the exam to get credit at Penn State and what credit you will you will get at Penn State. So basically, uh, you know, if you get a five on your Calc BC exam, you're going to get uh, eight credits of Penn State calculus here. It'll be like you've already taken two classes. Classes. Um, and if we get those score reports from the College Board, uh, we will add that credit to your record and it'll show up as those Penn State classes. So it's a great way to, to get some credit, um, you know, for the work you did in high school. Um, and we um, are happy to add that. We, we typically get them automatically after your senior year, but you might want to check when you come for orientation just to make sure that we receive some of your earlier AP test um, results um, and consider that as you're making your plan for the, for the future semesters so you're not scheduling classes that you potentially have credit for. Great advice. Thanks, Kim. All right, let's bring one of our students back up. Ava, uh, would you be able to speak to the out-of-state audience out there of students? We have a, quite a few of them in our audience here this evening. Um, just what is that experience like attending a school and, and traveling um, from another state to be able to come and attend Penn State? Uh, yeah, I can definitely talk about that. So I will say in the beginning of my first year, um, I know a lot of students were probably really scared coming from out of state. And I will say I was also very scared and very nervous because being so far away from home and everything. Um, but I will say that Penn State has definitely become like a second home to me. I don't want to say I'd barely felt homesick, but I really didn't feel all that like, homesickness that everyone always talks about because Penn State has like become my second family, honestly, and they have all those support systems. And they're always just someone that you can always lean on whenever you need that help. Thanks, Ava. Uh, we're gonna stick with the students. So um, I believe we're gonna jump to Maddie next. Uh, Maddie, can you share a little bit about what on-campus living is like from a student perspective? What are the dorms really like? What are the dining comments really like? all of the, you know, nitty gritty that people really want to know. 
So personally, I think dorm living really gets like a bad reputation. I honestly loved it. I lived in Pollock my first year, which is it's mostly first years. East is our all first year dorm. And then Pollock is our second most popular choice for first year students. So I ended up living in there and I absolutely loved it. I ended up going random for my roommate, but she became my very best friend and we're still friends even in junior year. And I had an all girls floor and then the floor above me was all boys, but it was super fun. We always used to hang out downstairs in the lobby, playing games, doing homework with each other. And some of the girls I lived with on my floor for my freshman year, I still live with now, which is super nice. We're still all very close. And same thing with the dining halls. I think everybody always thinks dining hall food is terrible. It's gross. It's a bad experience, but I'm probably the pickiest eater you will ever meet. And genuinely, I was always able to find something never had a problem with the dining halls and Pollock brunch on the weekends was my absolute favorite. (laughs) Thanks, Maddie. I've heard really good things about that Pollock brunch. I'm going to need to make my way over there one of these weekends to check it out. Uh, Nathaniel, let's check in with you. We've uh, obviously have some students out there asking questions about the different majors and what they're looking into in different interest areas. But what we really want to know is how easy is it to change a major once you are a student? Is is that a process that students can easily get through? So coming from my experience, I came into Penn State actually as a mechanical engineering major. Um, but after about a semester, a semester and a half, I decided that it really wasn't for me. So I ended up talking to academic advising and my academic advisor and I was able to quickly set myself down a path away from the College of Engineering and more towards what we call Division of Undergraduate Studies. So with Division of Undergraduate Studies, you can be there for two days to two years, basically up to your junior year at university. Um, I was there for a few I would say about two semesters, and I spent that time deciding between a few of my other pathways I was interested in. And through that time, I was given the information, I was given interviews, and I was able to really figure out where I wanted to go. So in essence, what I would say is that it worked with ease. There wasn't really a sense that I was gatekept to one major, and that in my time here, I could transfer to the countless degree programs that were at Penn State without any real strings attached to the circumstances. Wonderful. Thank you, Nathaniel. Uh, We have a question about new student orientation. So we're curious to know if um, Kim, if she's on here to come back on and speak to this point, is this something that is able to be attended virtually? So um, the the orientations that we mentioned that, that are in May, June, and July are all in-person orientations. And obviously that is the intended option for students. We want students to get on campus to connect with their resources in person. Uh, but we do know that isn't always an option. We do have other orientation that can be uh, right before the start of classes. Obviously a lot of our international students do participate in their global orientation that takes place in August right before classes start. So we try to provide some convenient options, particularly for those students who we know travel a long way uh, to get to Penn State. Uh, but the options are typically in person, and that is the 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 preferred method for orientation of its being on campus. But if um, you can definitely contact our office directly if we cannot accommodate an in-person orientation program for you. Thanks, Kim. All right, we have um, a really great question that was submitted for our housing representative, Kate. Um, Kate, can you speak to how Penn State handles food allergies and is it safe for students incoming with food allergies to eat at the dining commons and other eateries? Thanks, Beth. And yes, absolutely. Uh, We encourage uh, students to eat at all of the dining commons that we have available. We have a number of food operations, not only the all you care to eat dining commons in each of our housing areas, but we also have some grab and go locations. We have coffee shops. There are a lot of different options for students across campus. And that is what um, gives our current students who are living on campus a lot of flexibility. So we have two registered dietitians who work 
in housing and food services, and they are here to make sure that students are able to eat safely while they're on campus. So my first recommendation would be to um, connect with those uh, dietitians and um, oftentimes they're able to set up an appointment with you if you were on campus visiting, maybe during new student orientation, or if you were visiting us uh, during the spring for one of our accepted student programs on campus, you'll be able to connect with one of those registered dietitians, go to a dining commons and talk to the chef and some staff there about what your options can be. Additionally, when you're in the um, all you care to eat dining commons, there is a, uh, a card that is there for all of your dining options that lists um, some dietary information there. And um, there are certain sections that are available for students who may have gluten allergies um, and, and some other dietary restrictions. I will say too, um, there are halal options that are offered in all of the dining commons and in East specifically, there is an option called Pure, which is um, free of kosher allergens. So it's a it's a kosher um, it's a kosher option for students, which has become more and more um, popular and important here in these last few years. So a lot of really good options uh, for students. And and I will agree with Maddie. Uh, the food on campus is delicious, and you can't go wrong. There's creamery ice cream in all of the dining commons. So Definitely something to check out while you're while you're eating on campus. Thanks, Kate. Ava, we're going to bring this next question back to you. Um, University Park is quite a large campus, so we wanted to know from a student viewpoint, how easy is it really to get around campus? And the all important question that we get asked several, several, several times is can first year students have a car on campus? Uh, yeah, of course. So Penn State is a walking campus. So everything is like usually like a 15 minute, 20 minute walk, at least in my case, I will say it's a very easy to campus to like walk around. I never had any issues personally. Also, I will say a lot of students and also in my experience, bring a bike to campus. That makes it a lot easier if you say you don't want to walk. Um, I love my bike. So definitely bring one if you have one. Uh, also, if students can bring a car on campus, as a first year student, you are not allowed to bring a car on campus. But once you hit 29 credits, you're able to bring your car on campus, but you do have to pay that parking pass fee. I will say though, I don't really see the need for a car on campus since everything's already downtown. Everything I need is very walkable. Important point. <laughs> Thanks, Ava. Uh, we're going to invite Krista from Student Aid to come back on for another question. So, Krista, we want to know, since the FAFSA is delayed this year, is there anything that students can be doing now to prepare for when that date arrives that the FAFSA is open to them? So what are some steps that they can take right now? Yep, very good question um, and also very important. So, yeah, like I said, the um, we expect the FAFSA to be available December 31st, you know, completed as early as possible. We're, rec we're rec recommending um, have it filled out by February 15th for maximum consideration. But in the meantime, um, students can go out to um, studentaid.gov and complete, um, they can go out and just create their account if they don't already have, I mean, new students won't have one. Their parents might have one. Um, if they had, you know, a sibling that was already in uh, you know, in, in college, they might have one, um, but they're going to want to go out and create their account, which requires creating an FSA ID. Um, and then also um, this year, so the FAFSA is going to require uh, contributors, they're calling, um, it would be a parent or anyone who has to contribute information to the FAFSA as far as the, the financial information that has to be going to the calculations that's used in the FAFSA information. So there is, if you go to studentaid.gov, scroll all the way down to the bottom, there's a link to, um, it's called the launch of 2024-2025 FAFSA form. You wanna click that and there's information on there that tells you about some of the changes that are being made, but there's um, a nice section in there that links you out to a decision tree to, um, if you're in a situation where your parent, your biological parents aren't married, um, you don't live with them, um, their divorce got married, the, all different scenarios of who has to be a contributor and has to log in to that FAFSA information. But there's a nice decision tree in there. So you can go ahead and have that already in place um, for when it is time to fill out the FAFSA. 
Um, you're also going to want to, and actually, if you go to our homepage, which is uh, studentaid.psu.edu, um, in the upper left-hand corner of the page, um, there's a link to 2024-2025 uh, FAFSA resources. We went out and put information on there. There's some videos on there, some how-to guides, and just some different things to know what's going on with the with the changes and, and what um, you can expect um, as you complete the form. Um, you can also go to um, after the FAFSA is completed, it's very important. Actually, you can do that now as well. <laughs> Go to your My Penn State app and make sure that your social security number is validated in the app. Because um, once you do complete the FAFSA, that's how the Office of Student Aid pulls that information in and ties it together. Um, a lot of times that your social security number does not always um, come come in through that application process. Um, and if it doesn't, you know, you could go out, you could be missing out on some some aid money and you won't get your um, your aid package timely. Um, I'm trying to think, and then just but, yeah, those are great tips. <laughs> Thanks. Thanks, Krista. Um, so let's bring Nathaniel back up for another question. I know that we get asked this a lot, and I think I saw a couple questions in the chat about study abroad opportunities. And I've heard that um, you know the student process is is fairly easy, but Nathaniel, can you give us your viewpoint of? of how students go about studying abroad and uh, the opportunities available. Sorry about that. Um, so with city broad opportunities, there are opportunities on six out of the seven continents as of right now. We are looking into bringing back the Antarctica program, but it's just down for the time being. But uh, as you can probably tell by the six continents, there's countless um, study abroad opportunities from a whole wide variety of majors, degree programs, fields, et cetera. So for example, as a person who's big into teaching English and literature, um, in the coming months, I'm actually looking into doing one in London. It is known as the Literary London Program, and I'll be there for a month to um, examine a lot about London, about its connection to literature, while actually taking courses while I'm present there. And that's kind of the best thing about Penn State Study Abroad opportunities is you're not just there in the experience, but you're learning there as well. We also have various other programs where you can actually stay semesters rather than just like, as I said, the month program that I'm interested in doing. Um, they can come in and come in with either courses or actual full internships. So there are, as I stated, a ton of opportunities for studying abroad. And it's all located on one website, which is mostly known for PSU Global. Wonderful, we'll have to check back in with you, Nathaniel, after your trip and see how everything went. That sounds amazing. Um, but we're going to bring Kim back on to the camera for an admissions question. Uh, do students at this point need to turn in a high school transcript? Do they need to provide um, current grades that they're getting senior year? Um, you know, tell us all of all of that about high school transcripts and grades. Sure, thanks, Beth. Um, so you all completed that self-reported academic record. Uh, so you were telling us exactly what courses and grades you got in high school. We didn't ask for that transcript at that point, and we don't need your transcript yet. We actually will only ask for a final high school transcript from students who pay their enrollment deposit and intend to enroll at Penn State. So when that time comes, after you've graduated, you can request your high school to send us that final transcript so we can check that SRAR and make sure everything kind of jives with the final high school transcript that you have, and then you are set to go. So students do not have to provide mid-year grades. They don't have to do anything. Uh, just wait till that point of graduation and then send us your, your final transcript after that time. Thanks, Kim. All right, I love this next question that was submitted in our Q&A, so I'm going to ask it of all three of our students. So students, let's go in that uh, that order, Maddie, Ava, Nathaniel. What is your favorite Penn State tradition? 
I think for me, it's definitely all of the songs and chants during football games. I remember my very first foot, my very first football game, my freshman year, and just singing the alma mater with my friends and even strangers next to me that I didn't know. It just felt like such a community and truly sealed the Penn State experience for me. And it definitely helps that we won the football game. The atmosphere was just incredible. And I think that's probably my favorite tradition. Um, yeah, kind of similar to Maddie. I really enjoy the Penn State whiteout games. I think those are the best part of the whole football season. Uh, Penn State football is very big, obviously. Um, but yeah, I really enjoy that because, again, the sense of community. Also, it's just like really fun seeing everyone get ready and very hyped for a really big game. And yeah, so the Penn State whiteouts. Um, for me, my favorite uh, Penn State tradition would have to be the idea of um, Happy Valley hospitality. The inherent concept of that is that, you know, when you're at Happy Valley, when you're at University Park or at any of our Commonwealth campuses, um, everyone treats you with respect and kindness because here at Happy Valley or here at Penn State, we're all Penn Staters. We're all here with common interests. We're all here with common goals. And it's great to treat one another with respect. I love all three of those that you added um, to this discussion. I'm going to I'm going to pop in my own if you don't mind. I love the homecoming parade. I think that is my favorite Penn State tradition that we have um, every single year. I look forward to it. So uh, loved hearing all three of yours as well. And they are definitely good ones, too. Kate, we're going to swing questions back your way about housing. Would you be able to share with us what room types are available to first year students? Yes, great question. So I would say most first year students are going to live in a double room. So that is one room for two students. And uh, that would be in a traditional residence hall. So that means that the, the residence hall um, has not been renovated. There's no central air conditioning, um, essentially. However, I will say that the university is in the process of uh, renovating a number of our buildings. Uh, most of the buildings in the East uh, residence area have been renovated. So again, those spaces are double rooms. So two students per room, uh, but the space has been renovated. Uh, the uh, bathroom area, there are um, individual pods there. So there's a little bit more privacy in the bathrooms and there is a, a climate control in there, in those uh, residence halls. So you've got a little bit of, of air. Um, and the double rooms are, are found across campus. So that's the most common residence hall room type, but we do have suites that are found in the North residence area. So two bedrooms that are occupied by two students each, and they do share a bathroom. So that's a suite style living. And then um, there are some triples and some quads across campus as well. So we've got a number of different room types available. And my, my biggest suggestion would be to go to liveon.psu.edu to take a look at what is offered. You can see where all those housing areas are across campus and see what the, the options as well as costs, um, because each room type varies based on um, the, the room type, um, the cost will, will vary. So all good information to learn about, and you've got plenty of time to do your research and get those preferences in. Again, they're not due until May 15th, so you've got plenty of time for that. Great, thanks, Kate. Lots and lots of options out there. Uh, we're gonna take it back to the students because this is another fun one. So I'm gonna ask all three of you. So Nathaniel, we'll start with you this time and then we'll go Ava, then Maddie. So Nathaniel, can you share with us what your favorite class so far has been at Penn State? Of course. So looking at the past four semesters, I would say my favorite class so far has actually been unsurprisingly a literature-based one, but it is based directly and fully on graphic novels. And what that does is it takes an analytical and literary approach to dissecting a medium that's 
not really discussed in that light. A lot of people don't see the validity of analyzing things that are normally considered like comic books, graphic novels, etc. But through that course, I really got to analyze it and see how sort of beautiful the connection between drawings and words can fully be. Uh, so yeah, my favorite class, uh, Dreamer Penn State Education so far has been my bioethics class, Philosophy 132. Um, I just thought it was really an interesting class. We got to learn a lot about different um, ethical methodology while also learning a bit about like other people's point of views with those ethical methodologies and how it applies to the medical scene since I am planning on pursuing medicine in the future. So for me, I just thought it was very useful for my future career. For me personally, one of my favorite classes was actually one I took for my minor. It was Management 310, and it wasn't like a traditional management business class. It was like a very hands-on approach to if you wanted to invent something or create something like a business or even a product. It was just a very non-traditional atmosphere, and my professor was so fun, so engaging. It made me actually want to go to class. It was very discussion-based, and a lot of times we would just spend the class, you know, talking and bouncing ideas off each other, and it was a lot more entertaining for me than just like a traditional lecture would have been. Those all sound great. Thanks for sharing those. And there's just so many more. I mean, I'm, I'm guessing it was probably hard to, to select just one, but you all did a great job of doing that. Uh, Nathaniel, we're going to bounce back over to you for this next question. Um, how did you decide what minor to add? And was it an easy process to, to add that minor? So I will say adding the minor was very simple. It was a couple of clicks on our uh, website line path. However, deciding it was a little bit difficult. So in the educational field, we have a wide variety of minors. So for my choice, I ended up going with an English-based one. I felt like getting more courses in literature would assist me in being able to teach English and literature. However, there's a variety of options in that sector. For example, you can minor in a focus surrounding special education or educational management. So in reality, it really comes down to how you want to connect what you want to do. So for example, you may have a major in communications, but you want to branch out more towards uh, more maybe connections with business. That's possible. Um, in a similar correlation, I have um, a, uh, an educational peer who's also going for a business-related minor. There's a lot of correlations and connections that you can make through the connection between major and minor. Thanks so much, Nathaniel. Uh, we are going to jump back over to Ava. Ava, we always get questions about safety on campus. Can you just share your perspective of how safe you feel at University Park? Yes, of course. I personally feel very safe on campus. I've never had to use one of the many safety features we have on campus, like the blue light or the university police or anything like that. At least in my experience, I haven't had to use it. And I have many friends who also have never had to use that. Um, I personally just feel very safe on campus. I study late in the library a lot of the time. And when I go back to my dorm, the campus is very well lit. Sometimes you'll see the like university police kind of going around the streets. So I always feel very secure in my safety. And I've grown so friendly all the time. Time, so I've never had to worry about anybody else. Thanks, Ava. Maddie, we're going to come to you with another question that was uh, submitted through our Q&A. We're going back to the dining commons and the food. So can you share with us what meal plan did you have your first year? And was did you feel that that was adequate? And were you able to adjust it easily if you needed to? Yeah, absolutely. So I had the level two meal plan, which is slightly over a thousand dollars. So as I mentioned earlier, we do work on a dining dollar system, not a swipe system like some other schools do. So you're not limited to a certain amount of swipes per week. You can swipe as many times you want for as many meals a day. That's totally up to you. 
typically I would have breakfast in my dorm and then I would get something for lunch by myself and I would go out to dinner in the dining hall with my friends. Um, personally, I never had to add more money to my meal plan. Your dining dollars will carry over from fall to spring automatically. So I had a little bit of leftover money from fall that just carried over automatically to the spring. So I had a little extra money to spend then, which was really nice. And your meal plan works at the creamery too. So that was always an extra little bit of fun. <laughs> Great. Thanks, Maddie. All right. We are winding down our time here, but there have been several questions in our chat about why. Why did the three of you choose Penn State over all of those other options for colleges and universities out there? Um, so I would love if you could just take a moment, each, each of you, to give us your what we affectionately call your warm and fuzzy as to why you decided on Penn State over all those other choices. So Nathaniel, let's go ahead and start with you this time. All right, so the way I like to say that I chose Penn State was just because of the environment and the atmosphere. I didn't really get to see the University Park campus until later in my college journey. I actually started out uh, looking at one of the Commonwealth campuses, which is uh, Penn State Erie, the Barron College. And even from that view, I just fell in love with Penn State. There's a sense of atmosphere and connection between everyone, that everyone, as I kind of talked about earlier, that Happy Valley hospitality, that people are willing to work with one another, that they're willing to learn from one another. And those correlations just really keep everyone going. I mean, you get those correlations, as we're talking about, in the football games. That community is present and it's volatile it really burns all throughout the campuses and all throughout Penn State. And I think that's why I came here and what keeps me going here. I love that, Nathaniel, thank you. Maddie, let's go to you. Why did you choose Penn State? Yeah, so for me, I honestly did not know where I wanted to go to college. Um, my college tour should have happened in 2020, but obviously this got a little bit derailed from the pandemic. So I had to do a lot of research on my own. I drove around a lot of empty campuses. I didn't have official tours or visits. And even then, even on an empty blank campus, Penn State just had something that other schools didn't have. It looked like something out of a movie. It was absolutely gorgeous. And the more schools I visited and the more schools I looked at, I just kept comparing them to Penn State because Penn State had everything that they didn't have. And in the end, everything clicked for me. And I just knew I had to go here. And I accepted, didn't look back, and I do not have a single regret about it. Thanks, Maddie. And Ava, let's hear your why. Why Penn State? Uh, yeah, my why for Penn State. So um, my forensic science major, it's actually hard to find universities with that major. So it was definitely hard to like narrow down what schools I wanted to go to. So I, um, my cousin actually goes to Penn State and she said, Ava, just take one look at Penn State. I'm sure you'll love it. And I said, okay, yeah, I'll take your advice. So I did. Me and my family drove up to Penn State. We took one tour and I just absolutely fell in love with the school. The atmosphere of the students, I could picture myself walking around campus with a bunch of friends. I could picture myself studying in the library with my friends it was everything I wanted in a school um and I definitely felt again I mentioned support systems earlier um in the panel I just I love all support systems I can get from Penn State so I felt secure in being away from home also there was just that sense of community that you couldn't get anywhere else and I just loved it so much that Penn State was actually the only school that I ended up applying to so I will say Penn State was my number one choice <laughs> Right. Well, we're glad that you got in then, especially. <laughs> I loved hearing your warm and fuzzies from all three of you. So Maddie, Nathaniel, and Ava, um, you know, you volunteered your time to be here this evening. So we appreciate you loving Penn State so much that you came on a Thursday evening to share it with everybody um, from really around the world. We have registrants with us from not only across the United States, but from around the world tonight. So um, we can't thank you enough for sharing your viewpoints as a student. Um, thank you also to everybody that
that was on our panel, as well as those that were behind the scenes, busy answering all those questions. They really were flying fast through typing all those responses to everybody out there. Um, but if you do have further questions after this session ends here this evening, I just threw in the chat some links that we shared earlier, as well as email addresses to all of the offices that you see on the screen in front of you here to be able to connect with the correct office to answer those specific questions. Um, but again, our biggest thanks is to our audience out there tonight, our accepted students, the class of 2028, our future Penn Staters, their family, their friends, their supporters. We know that it is a team effort out there, um, you know, making it through high school and through the college application process. And I said it earlier, but, you know, we are just so proud of each and every one of you for being where you are now and receiving this acceptance into Penn State University Park. So congratulations. Um, we are here if you need us. I, I hope that you got the sense from tonight's session that we are here to help you through this process. We are here to support you. And we truly are a Penn State community. So we hope that you can decide if Penn State is the right fit for you. And we will welcome you into that Penn State community very, very warmly. So have a great night, everyone. And congratulations again.